In this video, we will focus on epigenetic replication and specifically its maintenance during DNA replication. This discussion will cover DNA modification replication, histone replication, histone modification preservation or maintenance, and a small introduction to their dynamics. First, let's understand the scope of the issue we are trying to address. In DNA replication, we look at how one DNA molecule is copied into two daughter DNA molecules. But eukaryotes have histones decorating the DNA. So when DNA replication makes two DNA duplex strands from this DNA, there are only three original histones. So the question is, should some of these histones go to the top or the bottom strand? Or should all of them just go to one daughter DNA and the other gets nothing? For simplicity, let's just assume that two histones go here and the third one goes here. Now you still have these three empty locations that do not have any histones. So during replication of the DNA, three new histones are needed, at least in this particular example. Now the problem is a bit more complicated. In our previous discussion on DNA replication, we have seen that ASF1 and CAF remodelers can break the histone octamer into individual histone units. So if we talk about the distribution of these histones, you can get a mix of these histone pieces. Maybe this one piece goes to this octamer, this another one goes here, and this tiny bit ends up here. Is this how it works? We will discuss the answers to this later in the video. Now, to fill in the gap, the three new histones that are needed are formed during the S phase since S phase has histones expressed at very high levels. So it is easy to fill in the empty spots in S phase. That is one side of the problem. Let's add a bit more complexity to our problem and talk about histone modification. We start with the same idea that DNA has replicated into two daughters and instead of histones, now we focus on the tails of the histones. And typically these tails have some form of modification, a post-translational modification. So after replication, when you distribute the histones, and let's assume the distribution is unbiased, the old histones will carry over the modification. But when new histones are added during the S phase, they will not carry any modification. So we have a dilution of the histone marks. And as I said, new histones do not have marks by default. So somehow the cell needs to restore the histone modification in both of these strands. And that is the second problem. How to maintain or copy the original state of the histone. In other words, how to overcome the dilution effect due to the DNA replication. Let's start our quest with something more simpler how to restore DNA modifications. These are modifications that are directly on the DNA, not on histones, but they're still an epigenetic state of the cell. These are heavily found near CPG islands, transcriptional start site, and promoters. I will take the example of DNA methylation to explain the idea behind copying DNA modifications. CPG islands are massive CG repeat stretches in the DNA often found near promoters or regulatory elements like enhancers. The cytosine in these CG repeats are often methylated. And if they are near promoters, these methylation can direct the positioning of histones in that region and affect the accessibility of transcription start sites. When the DNA is replicated, the semi-conservative style of DNA replication splits parent strands, which retain their methylation marks. However, the new synthesized daughter DNA does not have any methylation on the cytosine. This half and half feature is called hemimethylated state of the DNA. Special enzymes like DNMT1, which is a DNA methyl transferase, can bind this hemimethylated DNA and transfer methyl to the cytosine on the daughter DNA. This way, the cells maintain or copy the DNA methylation at a given locus. So in effect, you convert the hemimethylated state into a symmetrically methylated state. This process then also tends to preserve the identity of the underlying feature of the DNA. This covers the first agenda. 
Now let's focus on histone replication. The simple thing to note is that histone octamer is not a static thing. Yes, it is made of four different histones present as dimers, but it is not in a fixed state. The H3 and H4 dimers constantly move in and out of an octamer. The H2 histones, on the other hand, are a bit more stable. And most modifications that occur on histones happen on H3 histones and others on H4 histones. And H3 histones, like H2 histones, have multiple variants, like 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and even the centromere histone called SenPa. The 3.1 and 3.2 histones are called canonical H3 histones. And others, like H3.3, are non-canonical histones. Let me expand on this canonical part. These are the so-called default H3 histones. This means that during DNA replication, when new H3 histones are installed, it is always the canonical versions. And these canonical histones are inactive by default, which means that places where H3 histones go become specifically heterochromatin. On the other hand, H3.3 is typically associated with an active mark, but that does not mean it is always active. In contrast to the canonical H3 histones, 3.3 is installed after the DNA replication is completed. Let's understand this difference in a bit more detail. Imagine you've got two loci next to each other. One contains gene A, which is marked by 3.3 histones and is active. The adjacent locus is marked by canonical H3 histones, and it has a gene B, which is inactive. During replication in S phase, the DNA is copied, and the dilution of histone occurs, and the two DNA copies get equal share of the old H3.3 histones. Now the new histones need to be added, as we have noted in our discussion already. We also note that during DNA replication in S phase, the canonical histones are added to the DNA. So the empty space in this locus is filled by the canonical histones. As a result, gene A in this position will become relatively inactive because of the lack of sufficient H3.3 histones. The other locus is unaffected because it was already inactive. So to reiterate, in S phase, a majority of 3.1 and 3.2 are made, and very little of H3.3 is made. Going back to this locus, we haven't maintained the epigenetic profile of the locus. The new DNA is relatively inactive and the original parent DNA was much more active in this state. So we need to replace all canonical H3 histones with the H3.3 variant, and then install new modifications to the new 3.3. And this is the question we started with earlier as well. Since S phase has canonical histones at very high level, the replacement of canonical histones only occurs after the S phase has passed. To put it another way, outside of S phase, H3.1 and H3.2 are not made, as we have already noted, which means only H3.3 is available to replace the canonical H3 histones outside of S phase. So the incorporation of 3.3 is a replication independent process. Say you have a promoter or transcription start site or a regulatory element where you need to replace canonical histones. There are specific chaperones for H3.3 called HERA or DAX that can bring 3.3 to the required locus to replace the canonical H3 histones. I won't be going into the mechanism of how all this works since the literature on this is relatively new and not super clear. Anyways, this is only the histone replacement. The new 3.3 by default does not carry any sort of histone modification. So the tails of these newly installed or replaced 3.3 need to obtain the original histone modification. This brings us to the next part about restoring or copying the histone modifications. There are three main models to explain the maintenance, propagation, or copying of histone modifications. The first is the template binding model. Let's begin by drawing out the simple schematic of unbiased histone distribution. Now, new histones are added to the daughter DNAs, which do not have any modifications on their tails. The old histones will retain the modification because of the unbiased dilution or distribution that we have discussed earlier. 
There are specific proteins that can recognize existing histone modifications. These proteins have the product binding domains. In this case, the product is a specific histone modification. This protein usually has a partner, which contains a catalytic domain that can recognize the adjacent histones and its empty tails, and adds the same modification which the product binding domain has recognized. This happens on both daughter DNAs. An example of this product binding protein is the EED protein, which has its partner called EZH2. Another way to call this is the reader and writer proteins. The writer EZH2 installs a trimethyl group to the new H3K27. So the reader EED reads the existing H3K27 ME3, and the writer installs a new H3K27 trimethylation on the adjacent histones. This EED and EZH2 complex is part of a larger polycomb repressive complex too. As the name suggests, this is involved in silencing or heterochromatin propagation. Now this same locus will be heterochromatinized in the daughter DNA as well. Now that we're here, let's also look at the recovery rate of the histone modifications. More specifically, since there is a dilution of histones in S phase, how long does it take for the new modifications to appear? As an example, let's focus on the levels of H3K27 trimethylation. In the S phase, the histones are diluted and the modification levels dilute as well. It actually isn't until the start of the next G1 phase that the recovery is complete. So there is quite a bit of lag before new histones acquire the repression mark. Since this is happening outside of S phase, note that most of the histone modification is a replication independent process. The second model is called the constitutive model. This one is a replication coupled mechanism. Let's start with the same basic picture. Assume we have a locus with a mix of H3.3 and canonical H3 histones. Upon replication, these histones are distributed in a 50-50 ratio. Since this is replication coupled, which means it is happening in the S phase, only canonical H3 histones are present to fill in the empty spaces. To add complexity to this, let's just say that the older H3 canonical histones had a modification. Since this is a replication coupled mechanism, here is a dummy picture that it occurs in proximity to a moving replication fork. The moving replication fork, according to this model, can recruit proteins that recognize the old canonical H3 histones and modify the adjacent newly incorporated histones. And this sequence of modification can continue along the locus. However, it cannot modify histone H3.3. A real life example of this type of protein is ATRX5 or 6, which recognizes canonical H3 histones only but cannot bind the H3.3 histone variant. This makes this protein a specific histone modifier. We call it constitutive because it occurs during replication in contact with the replisome. So it is a default or constitutive state. This specific protein is seen in a lot of plants and its job is to add a methyl group to the H3K27. The previous case was a trimethylation case. This is a single methylation case. Methylation in this example also means that the ATRX5 and 6 causes condensation of the chromatin. The third model in focus is called the bridging model. This model is specifically associated with the compaction of chromatin. Once again, let me sketch out the starting point of the replicating DNA. In this case, our focus is on the replicating locus rather than a pre or a post replication state of the same region. According to the bridging model, there are specific proteins that recognize specific histone modifications like methylation. They will keep bridging or oligomerizing until an adjacent partner is available and they can even bridge the sister DNA. As we have seen, after the replication is finished, the PRC2 can methylate specific histone tails. And this bridging protein can recognize and extend its bridging state. This bridge protein example can be PRC1, which tends to oligomerize or condense the chromatin. The PRC2 example was to start the silencing of the DNA. It promotes tighter DNA contact with the histone, but not compactness of the locus. The condensation of the histones and repression is completed by the bridging protein PRC1 which in a way depends on PRC2. 
So the template and bridging model in this example is codependent. I have focused on methylation example and specific proteins and histone H3 examples. These are intuitive to understand for the sake of this video. Keep in mind that these models and mechanism are in no way specific to these histones and proteins, or modifications for that matter. Alright, this sums up the third agenda of this video. Let's finally switch gears and quickly go over the dynamics of this epigenetic maintenance. Two things we will go over is the speed of histone copying and the distribution bias of these histones. If we sketch out a rough replication fork with the helicase, the recovery of the histones in the daughter DNA is immediate, with very little lag. However, the 200 bases behind the replication fork are always empty, and that's the nucleosome-free region. This could be the actual limit of histone recovery, or maybe the replication fork is just too crowded and the histones can't actually stick to the DNA in those 200 bases. Funny coincidence is that the 200 bases is also around the length of an Okazaki fragment, and we have also seen this number come up in the termination zone. Now the distribution bias. I mentioned in the beginning that the histone optimers are possibly broken into smaller units. Now if we were to redistribute the old histones, we have multiple possible options. You can have one of the daughter DNAs get a complete set of old histones, and then the other daughter gets a brand new histone. This would be a conservative style of histone distribution. Alternatively, you can have old histones distributed in half and half with the new histones. This would be semi-conservative style. This is for one histone. We can complicate the scenario and say the same thing for a large stretch of chromatin as well. The old histones can all go to one daughter and new histones to the other daughter. Alternatively, you can have the unbiased distribution where old histones dilute in half and half format. This is what we have assumed in our discussion in this video so far, and this is the semi-conservative nature. Now you may think that the biased copying of histones is weird and does not make sense, because it does not preserve the epigenetic state and makes the two daughter cells look very different. The unbiased method allows for preservation and propagation of epigenetics in both daughter cells equally. And we can actually use the bridging model to explain this more concretely. If the distribution of histones was biased to one of the daughter strands, then you cannot have a template on one of these DNAs. Which means when bridge proteins oligomerize, the silencing will only happen on one of the daughter DNA. The other DNA remains active. This is useful when you have stem cell differentiation, or germline cells maturing because the asymmetry provides a sort of diversity in epigenetic and gene expression profile of the daughter cells. So the lack of preservation is sometimes useful. The preservation of epigenetics is more common to mitotic cells, which are solely responsible for say growth and proliferation, as you might expect in somatic cells. This covers the short intro to dynamics. The field of epigenetic replication is still new, and lots of things are being discovered every day. I hope this video helps you understand the nature of the underlying challenge and gives you some perspective into possible solution.